Hello everyone, and welcome back to another installment of Red Raptor Writes. This video has been a long time coming. Ever since the September of 2017, I dramatically foreshadowed the coming of this butchering. I think it's time I finally confront Bioshock Infinite's Burial at Sea and hold it accountable for murdering the entire series. Bioshock Infinite was bad, really bad, but at least I can still go back and enjoy my favorite game, its pretty good sequel, and the great DLC to the pretty good sequel. Infinite's DLC though, doesn't just fail in isolation, but makes a desperate, last ditch effort to bring the rest of the series down with it. Not only is it straight up not a good time to play, but it ruins Rapture, ruins the characters, and makes hard retcons in a sad attempt to shoehorn Elizabeth where Elizabeth clearly doesn't belong. The entirety of the two-part DLC is an abysmal mess. About a year ago in the December of 2018, I made the great 70-minute Bioshock Infinite rant, so I'll be referencing a lot of that. This Burial at Sea rant is kind of a sequel, so if you haven't seen it, be sure to check it out. So you guys have waited long enough, here's my rant on Bioshock Burial at Sea. Let's dig up this steaming piece of dung. So in summation, this review will act as my resignation letter from both the world of theatrical criticism and the world in general. Tomorrow, I will fill my pockets with stones and walk into the cold ocean. Okay, so let's start off with the story and run through the plot of Burial at Sea. And keep in mind that I use the term story very loosely. I don't know what in Shrek's name Ken Levine was thinking, but this half-baked DLC is written like straight up fan fiction, and not even the good kind too. The kind that makes you sit and wonder what your favorite fandom would be like if things went differently? No no, not that. This is a Sonic level fan fiction. Burial at Sea comes across like a handful of edgy middle schoolers came together and wrote a bad detective novel with a Bioshock spin to it. But to call this actual Bioshock would be a crime against humanity, considering how amazing the first one was. What was that? It's a uh, new plasmid. Let's me, let's me bring in things that might exist, but uh, don't. I'm not sure I understand. What's it called? Tear. Where'd you find that? You don't expect the girl to share all her secrets, do you, Mr. Dewitt? So, where were we? Oh yeah, this monstrosity starts off with an intoxicated Booker DeWitt waking up from a bad dream, <laughs> just like this game. But this isn't just any Booker, no, who you're playing as is actually a version of Comstock who attempted the baby trade with an alternate Booker, but this time Anna's head fell off instead of her pinky. The guilt from this event drove Comstock back into your typical drunk depressed Booker, Except now he's in Rapture to escape the pain, and he conveniently doesn't remember anything just so us audiences can be surprised later because science. Science, Meredith, science! So Booker, or Comstock, is interrupted by an oddly cryptic 50s Elizabeth who is searching for a missing girl named Sally. Booker believed her to be dead. But Elizabeth reveals otherwise, and for whatever reason, Sander Cohen is the only source with useful information. Apparently, Cohen of all people got involved in trafficking girls to become little sisters, which, alright, I guess. More about him later. Shenanigans occur, you find Cohen, and he sends you down into the sunken Fontaine's department store. Of course, I'll get back to everything later, but I'm doing a quick drive by. We go through a knockoff medical pavilion where we have to find a plasmid to get another plasmid to reach our goal. Then, like everyone and their mothers suspected, Sally is found but is now a little sister. 
so the two draw her out of the vents, which have been conveniently redesigned for any of this to make sense, but don't worry, that's far from the only retcon to Rapture. So, Sally screams, a changed bouncer Big Daddy comes and murders Booker, but Elizabeth doesn't really care because, plot twist, she knows that Booker's a Comstock, and this entire first part was just an overly elaborate scheme of Elizabeth's to murder this final Comstock, even though there are infinite realities, so that must mean infinite Elizabeths and Comstocks, and okay, okay, I went over the stupidity of all this last time. BAM, that's part one finished. No, no seriously, you just paid $15 to walk around a shreked up version of Rapture and shoot a few more splicers. Now pay another $15 for part two. Not only is Burial at Sea bad, but also severely overpriced. You're paying half the price of a full game for this piece of garbage. See that? Without all your smoke and mirrors, no one would stomach this garbage. What do you say? Garbage? <laughs> Now, on to part two. It starts off with Elizabeth chilling in her idealized shroom-induced Paris. You know, right before all hell broke loose. I don't know what the writers were thinking, but we got a total Shrek knockoff for no reason. Seriously, are the writers so creatively bankrupt that they have to pull scenes straight out of Shrek? Uh, alrighty then. Elizabeth chills in Paris until she begins to feel bad about the whole incident. You know, using a kidnapped, now deformed child as bait for her elaborate murder scheme. She goes back to Rapture, only to find that she was killed by the Big Daddy too. This DLC was already strange enough, but Hokey pokey magic, when this murderous psychopath returns to the dimension of her first death, all versions of Elizabeth collapse into one. Instead of a single, super sane version of herself, she becomes a weak, ordinary girl. So the moment we're allowed to play this omnipotent master of time and space, she loses all power. Wow, thanks guys. Whoever wrote this, was so obviously drunk at the keyboard and just making up crap as they went along. Listen, I'm um, gonna be honest with you. I, I'm kind of retarded. You know what? Do you care? Do you really care about the terrible fan fiction story? Let me speed this up. Elizabeth gets captured by Atlas, who is for some reason stuck in the sunken apartment store despite being able to see Simon and get plastic surgery. Before his bandits murder her and Sally, the no longer OP anime character is guided by her imaginary Booker Fairy to make a deal that she'll raise up the sunken store and all his followers in it in exchange for her life and Sally's. She'll do this by obtaining a Lutest particle which makes things float, only she can't teleport to Columbia. Elizabeth needs to access a tear in a conveniently placed lab of Suchong's located in a nearby diner because Suchong and Fink made trans-dimensional contact. But before hopping through the tear, she needs to fix Suchong's Lutest device which she can conveniently do after a long diversion made solely to extend the DLC's runtime. Once the machine is repaired, she hops through into Columbia at the same time past her and Booker were escaping Finkton. After a few more stealth areas and exposition for everything left unexplained in the base game, Elizabeth gets the Lutest particle, returns to Suchong with a hair sample of herself that he wants, fights a couple of Andrew Ryan's goons, and lifts the building to the level of the rest of Rapture. Instead of honoring his deal, Atlas predictably turns on her, interrogating Elizabeth to learn where Jack, or the ace in the hole, is, because this Fontaine is completely incompetent, but we'll get there soon enough. In order to save herself and Sally from a lobotomy, she gets tasked with retrieving the Would You Kindly trigger phrase from Suchong, who is in the middle of bonding a big daddy to a little sister, and it goes about as well as you remember. Elizabeth gets the code, returns to Atlas, and gets wrenched to the face. She dies, but not without getting a key glimpse into the future that Sally becomes one of the little sisters Jack rescues and brings with him to the surface, despite being readily available to harvest for Atlas and his followers, but oh well, I guess they forget about that Adam Goldmine right in front of them. The final Elizabeth plops to the ground and is now finally dead. Good lord, that was a lot to get through. And it doesn't help that every character is in the habit of explaining everything as vaguely and mysteriously as possible for the sake of dramatic effect. You know, I'm glad Elizabeth died in such a brutal manner. Ever since Finkton, all this maniac cared about has been murder and vengeance. Her hatred and lust for revenge turned her into a crazy trans-dimensional serial killer who comes up with elaborate, nonsensical schemes to murder Comstocks. 
Like, seriously, instead of just approaching Comstock, reminding him of his past sins, and putting the poor man out of his misery, she sends him on this long journey through Rapture to find Sally, draw her out of hiding, and force him to remember through his own actions what he did to baby Anna, and then have him killed by a conveniently placed big daddy. Lady, was all that really necessary? Again, really bad fanfiction. I'm glad she got not one, but two brutal deaths. Sorry, that was a lot of explaining, but I need some base to start my ranting. Burial at Sea has plenty of the same problems as the base game. The story is unnecessarily complicated and is chock full of contrivances. Rarely does it seem like you're actually making progress, but just running a list of errands and dealing with setbacks as you can tell by my need to speed up the plot summary. Just like Infinite itself, this game is far more interested in sounding intelligent and confusing rather than telling a compelling story. Part 1 ends like Infinite, explaining to the player in an exposition dump what's been happening this whole time rather than giving a satisfying conclusion. Part 2 ends by telling us why the event should matter rather than the player feeling for themselves that they do. After the very well-crafted original and the simplicity of 2, I have no idea why this series became so pretentious. The result is exactly what you'd expect. No emotional investment beyond my massive grin as Elizabeth dies. Another massive failure in Burial Story is something I'm going to name Prequel-itis. Remember how in some prequels, they feel the need to show you every nostalgic thing answer every non-question from the original, and cram it down into a single story? My brain goes straight to the Solo movie. Every remarkable thing about Han Solo was crammed into a two-hour movie. Han meets Chewie, becomes a smuggler, finds Lando, gets the Millennium Falcon, and makes the Kessel Run, all in a single, dumb story, as opposed to interesting things happening to him throughout the course of his life. So yeah, Burial at Sea has a bad case of prequel-itis. Everything just has to happen on December 31st, 1958, or immediately following. But it's not even like Han Solo, whose backstory we didn't have much grasp of in the original trilogy. Nah, this is Bioshock! All major pieces of the backstory have been woven together already. So, in an effort to cram everything on this one day, much of the lore gets broken. Really, the only things that happened on New Year's Eve were the start of the Rapture Civil War with Atlas's bombings, and the death of Subject Delta with Lamb's escape. Su Chong didn't die two weeks after New Year's Eve. He died long before, and we know this because he long precedes Delta. If somehow an Alpha series wanders too far from his little sister, our physical failsafe kicks in, a chemical trigger that induces coma. It is a symbiotic relationship enforced by the girl's pheromone signature. The first successful candidate was Delta, I believe. It is unfortunate that poor Dr. Su Chong will not be here to raise a glass. Similarly, the bond between sister and protector was formed long before because, again, Delta. There weren't bouncers and rosies roaming around. No, Alpha series were all the rage back then. Atlas doesn't get the trigger phrase then either. He's known it long before. He also didn't summon Jack here either. No, plan as day, Jack arrives in 1960. The DLC tries to show you the rapture highlights but breaks all previously established canon to do so. And these are just the beginning of the changes. You know, as much as I dislike Infinite, at least it contained its terribleness. Yeah, you visit Rapture in the end, but it's more like a cameo, so I can still enjoy the originals without thinking of Infinite. But Burial at Sea makes a horrible attempt to cram Elizabeth into the center of Rapture's story, essentially breaking Bioshock with massive retcons and inconsistencies. It makes all the characters we've gotten to know appear super incompetent, and we'll talk about that now. Mm -hmm. 
Frank Fontaine is an idiot in Burial at Sea. All the characters we come across in this overpriced trash magically become useless hacks in order for Elizabeth to seem useful, just like the player in Infinite. Fontaine, or Atlas, is the worst example of this. First of all, I'm not even going to question how the intelligent, conniving mobster ended up in Fontaine's department store 5,000 fathoms below Rapture, needing Elizabeth to bust him out. Nope, I'm not even gonna ask. Second, and more importantly, why does he need Elizabeth to bring him Jack's trigger phrase? How is he so shrekking stupid as to not know that Would You Kindly controls Jack? It's a detrimental retcon that turns the brilliant schemer into a moron. Suchong and Tenenbaum worked for Fontaine for years. Through Dr. Tenenbaum, he purchased Jack as a fetus from the mother Jasmine Jolene. It was Fontaine who commissioned the creation of Jack and the mind control plasmid. He specifically ordered everything about Jack, including the mind control. You think you're some kind of hero? I ordered you up from Suchong like a Chinese dinner. A little from column A, a little from column B. He paid so much attention to the child that, well... Hate to see you this way, kid. Hell, I was there when you were born. Yes, Jack was just his ace in the hole, a phrase I never want to hear again at this point, but Fontaine genuinely cared about his creation. Not only that, not only that, but Fontaine was so familiar with the mind control plasmid that he had Suchong create Lot 192 as an antidote for it, just in case their new creation was ever used on him. Frank Fontaine was a clever businessman who was always 10 steps ahead of Ryan and Sullivan. Remember, this is the man who set up a smuggling ring, avoided capture from Sullivan, faked his own death to get the jump on Ryan, organized an entire rebel movement, and built an assassin from scratch just in case nothing worked out. He did all this, yet somehow finds himself trapped in a sunken prison and not knowing how to contact his assassin? Fontaine's entire grand master plan depends on Elizabeth? I have no words. Nothing. I rest my case. Another idiot now is Suchong, and by extension, maybe Tenenbaum, and quite possibly every scientist in Rapture. Now of course, the big idea behind Rapture was a city free from the moral and government restraints of the surface that were bringing mankind down. The new freedom to expand and create, the gathering of some of the world's leading scientific minds, and the discovery of the Atom Slug led to all the amazing achievements we saw in the city. But their objectivist philosophy became their downfall as well. It was the slug, the scientists' endless tinkering, and Fontaine's funding that resulted in plasmids. This in turn led to Little Sisters and Big Daddies. Wait, that's what you thought? <laughs> nope! It was the collaboration between Suchong and Fink that created these things. A scientist from 1912 was needed to help Suchong. In Infinite, Songbird's design and bond to Elizabeth was a simple nod to what came before, but nah, Fink and Suchong were sharing notes and collaborating this whole time. Isn't it embarrassing that Fink was able to get his subjects to bond, but Suchong couldn't? Fink, a man from nearly 50 years in the past, is better at sciencing. Suchong, like Fontaine, is also so incompetent that he needs Elizabeth for his dirty work. Not knowing that she is the girl who Songbird bonded to, he demands that she get a sample of the girl so he can find in her genes what made the link. Come on, man. Copying Fink's notes? Really? The two also built the Vita Chamber together and created several new and drinkable plasmids. 
All these inventions were supposed to be the achievements of Rapture, showing what scientists can do once the shackles of big government are removed. But nah, he needed outside help. Collaboration with Columbia really takes away from its achievements and is yet another huge retcon. Next up, we have Sander Cohen, who I'll admit doesn't necessarily get ruined, but isn't nearly as good as he was back in the original. Here's the thing, Bioshock Infinite had this weird idea that just by shoving wacky characters who say wacky things in the player's face, that it'd make them memorable like Cohen. But the writers completely missed what made the crazed artist great in the first place. It wasn't just that he was crazy, but also his relationship with Jack, and his presence all over Fort Frolic. When the player arrives at the mall, Cohen's been betrayed by three disciples and is dealing with a really bad pianist. Jack comes and behaves as his obedient servant because that's all Jack has ever been. He's exactly what Cohen's been looking for all along, causing a fascination. They were perfect foils for each other. And Cohen just goes hand in hand with Fort Frolic with his audio diaries and artworks all over not to mention his total control over every inch of it. But nope, Burial at Sea still holds over the bad habit of just shoving crazy characters at the player and hoping they stick, which is exactly why you will never, never hear anyone compliment Sander Cohen in this game, but have everyone who's played the original consider him one of the best parts. Andrew Ryan I'll briefly touch on since A, Bioshock 2 kinda sank the character anyways, and B, he's nothing more than a glorified cameo here. He makes one really dumb decision, which is sinking Fontaine's department store and using it as a prison. At this point in Rapture's story, Ryan has already nationalized Fontaine Futuristics, a bold move that sent shockwaves throughout the city as fears of big government grow. In short, Andrew Ryan owns everything Fontaine. He owns the plasmids, the technology, the buildings, the scientists, the little sisters, everything. So why then would he sink a building that he owns full of saleable goods that he owns? Why would such a calculating businessman waste hundreds of thousands in real estate and goods that he can profit from? Ryan asked, should a farmer not be able to sell his food? Is a potter not entitled to a profit from his pots? Also, why turn the store into a prison? Isn't that exactly the purpose of Persephone? A place where he can quiet political dissidents and lock away criminals? Oh right, maybe you noticed by now, but Burial at Sea tries its best to ignore Bioshock 2's existence. You know, no Alpha series, no Sinclair, no Alexander, no Lamb, no Persephone. The most you get are a few Rapture Tribune signs and an Adonis photo. I mean, I'm not a fan of everything 2 did, but come on! Irrational Games shouldn't have ignored it just because they didn't make it. So dumb. One last character that this abomination decides to destroy is actually someone from Infinite. One of the very few and far between aspects I managed to find enjoyment in was Daisy Fitzroy and her Vox Populi. Yes, many gameplay and story problems got even worse when they came into the forefront, but I like what Irrational did there. They send a clear message with the Vox that even when fighting for a worthy cause like equality, it's possible to become too extreme. Actually, it's more than likely that an uprising will be hijacked by radicals. Then the movement made to stop injustice becomes just as bad, if not worse, than what came before. I despise Infinite, of course, but still, great message. But here comes Burial at Sea to ruin one of the few parts I liked about the base game. Because, haha, <laughs> nope, Daisy Fitzroy wasn't an extremist. She was actually a very sane revolutionary. But in order to develop Elizabeth's character, the Lutesses convinced Fitzroy to give her a threat to rise to the occasion for. So Daisy agreed to pretend like she was gonna kill Fink's son just to get Elizabeth to kill her 
and send a demigod along her arc. Wow, way to just ruin yet another character. Oh my god. My disappointment is immeasurable. And my day is ruined. Perhaps the highlight of Burial at Sea, the most advertised idea, is the player's return to Rapture. Yeah, I know we've already discussed the terrible fanfiction-esque story and a couple of inconsistencies, but hey, it's still Rapture, right? WRONG! Haven't used that one in a while. Bioshock Burial at Sea absolutely fails at capturing Andrew Ryan's City of Rapture in just about every way imaginable. Even for a pre-war rapture that we've only gotten a glimpse of before, the setting still falls flat on its face. This is not rapture, this is not Bioshock, and this is not a good game by any means if that wasn't clear already. Let's start with something basic, the aesthetic. Wow, the creators couldn't even get that right. Before I tear this apart, at least they incorporated some of the humanist architecture we saw before. The city was built to celebrate human achievement and free will, so it's nice to see that represented here in the art. Anything else? Yeah, no. Whoever designed these areas totally missed the general art style of Rapture. The real Rapture we saw in the original was created in the art deco style of the early 1900s. Many of the interiors and exteriors we encountered were reminiscent of the Great Depression era, the 30s and 40s. Andrew Ryan created his paradise in 1946, separating from the rest of the world, so it makes sense that by 1959, they still followed this style, instead of changing with the rest of the West. Burial at Sea takes this style and alley-oops it into the trash because it goes full-blown 1950s and early 60s instead. The DLC goes far more post-war and less Great Depression like it should be. The places we visit as Comstock and Elizabeth take after that 50s diner feel with strips of chrome, the bright colorations, and heck, even the bathyspheres have fins now. Let me repeat that. The bathyspheres have fins. Oh yeah, and that's another retcon. Personalized submarines instead of the typical ones we saw all over the city. But anyways, the setting we return to feels far more Fallout and less Bioshock. Maybe Todd Howard is ruining this series too. Who knows? Also, when designing its setting, Burial took on yet another really bad holdover from Infinite. The Civilians. If you remember from my rant about the base game, I pointed out how Vigors are scattered around Columbia and that they're advertised everywhere, but we never got to see anybody actually using them aside from a few rare enemy types. This broke the internal logic of the world, and that occurs here too. Plasmids and tonics were vital to the fabric of society in Rapture. Plasmids to Rapture were like Tim's to New York. The high demand for the entire atom industry led to the rise of Fontaine, the need for little sisters to produce it, big daddies to protect the little sisters, and the entire fall of Rapture. Most citizens in Rapture were splicing themselves silly, leading to nearly all inhabitants being crazed splicers by the time we saw it in 1960. We spend a fair amount of time amongst Rapture's civilians, but we never see anyone splicing or using plasmids aside from a single waiter. They're only present for the player to use, but lack any foundation in the world itself. It's really funny. Infinite shoehorned plasmids into Columbia, calling them Vigors, and it didn't work at all. But now that we're back in Rapture, Irrational Games still manages to screw them up. Ken Levine and company managed to collapse one of the key foundations of their own setting. You're trash. Let's talk more about Columbia, because the DLC takes way too many cues from it. Columbia was a city in the clouds that we visited in 1912. Rapture was under the Atlantic, and we got to explore its remains in 1960 and 1968. The two settings in the series 
are completely different, yet for some reason, Burial at Sea's failed interpretation of Rapture chooses to copy several elements from Columbia that make zero sense being included. First off, the level design. Because Columbia was floating in the air, its areas were very open and free. The player could fly around main hub areas, shoot up the place, and then visited offshoots from there. Rapture on the other hand, had players confined to the buildings under the ocean. There were a few larger areas, but mostly small corridors and tunnels. Bowshock got us to feel claustrophobic. Burial at Sea takes the large, open areas of Columbia and brought them to the very confined rooms of Rapture. When your city is underwater, space is everything, so to waste half of the volume on these large open spaces makes no sense. This leads to an even worse offender, Skyhooks and Skylines, renamed Air Grabbers and Numo Lines. Now why, in all that is gay frogs, would Skylines be in Rapture? Sorry to double dip on that Alex Jones there. Again, in Colombia, it was mainly open air. Skylines allowed people to fly between buildings and platforms. In Rapture, again, space is limited. There are no grand open skies to fly through. Their explanation is that kids ride around on them, but the Numo lines lead straight into the water. <laughs> so that's where they all went. It's a great example of shoving Columbia where Columbia doesn't belong. Also, kinetoscopes. This one, why? Just why? Here, please hit me as hard as you can. Once again, their presence made sense in a 1912 city, but now we're in 1958. Colored movies and television are a thing now. Kinetoscopes were almost 20 years old, even in Infinite. So imagine the highly advanced Rapture using technology over 60 years old. Just throwing this out there, Rapture split from the world in 1946. Uh, The Wizard of Oz released in 39. Yeah, screw this junk. Okay, one final point I'll tackle with post-war Rapture is how idealized it is. As in, the underwater city is seen from rose-colored glasses. Everything looks so neat and clean and calm until descending into the sunken store. But this shouldn't be the case. Yes, Booker and Elizabeth mentioned the disappearance of little girls and child trafficking, but this is a prime example of telling rather than showing, which is never good. In video games, the player should explore and experience aspects of the world for themselves, not just be told things. Heck, this show rather than tell storytelling was something the original mastered. Here in the DLC, because we're only told, there isn't the same effect. And yes, we also see Cohen being crazy, shocking dancers, but let's be honest, this is rather tame for the artist. We've seen him do much worse before. Okay, so supposedly, episode 1 takes place on New Year's Eve, 1958, supposedly. But the intro to Bioshock 2 happens on the exact same day, and just look at the difference. 2 starts with a bonded alpha series, escorting his little sister, and immediately we're hit with the gravity of the situation. Leaks and puddles everywhere. A dead woman just laying on the floor unattended. Eleanor sucking the blood from the corpse to consume for herself. And then in the next room, people are partying like nothing out of the ordinary. Soon after that brief moment, we're back to the chaos. A gang of splicers assaulting Eleanor causing a brutal fight with Delta in which these thugs actually use plasmids. Again, little sisters drinking blood, but now just standing in line taking instructions. This was Rapture. This is what the place looked like by New Year's Eve. Not this pretty, elegant wonderland. Burial at Sea tries to trick the player into thinking this is Rapture by constantly hitting the nostalgia button. Endless references to old characters, shops we've seen before, tons of the same music and sound effects, 
and even the visual of a mother and crib. But these gags are just a surface level scam. Burial doesn't actually understand Rapture at all. Finally, let's move on to something else. If I'm being totally honest with myself, the gameplay in Burial at Sea is, at the very least, a step up from Infinite's broken mess. Again, if you want more of my thoughts on Infinite specifically, the link is right here. But the DLC isn't awful in this regard for Episode 1. We'll get to Episode 2 in a bit, because, oh boy. So, at least when playing as Comstock, it's typical Infinite gameplay, but with a few key improvements. The first being the ability to carry more than two weapons at any given time. Good lord, was that a horrible change in our trip to Columbia. Thankfully, the gun reel is back, allowing the player to alter between any weapon they've picked up at any time. Now you're not spending fights running around like a headless chicken looking for ammo mid-fight, or having to constantly stop to buy more ammo for your favored guns. This goes hand in hand with the glorious fact of no weapon upgrades this time around. The combination of these two changes prevents the infinite disaster where you are forced to stick to the two or three guns you've spent the money to upgrade for the whole game. And if you ran out of ammo, you either had to constantly buy more or switch to a gun that you haven't upgraded. And sometimes, there will be a desert of upgraded guns with areas upon areas of nothing useful. Especially in the late game when the weapons pool is doubled. No, no, none of that crap in Burial. Also, in Episode 2, Elizabeth is able to carry multiple medical kits at once, as opposed to Infinite, and occasionally Episode 1, where if you were low on health, you either ran around chicken-style looking for health, or booked it to the nearest vending machine mid-fight, breaking the flow of combat. Yeah, she can only carry 3 instead of Jack's 9 or Delta's 6 maximum, but still, it's progress. That's the positives done. But before I continue my organized list of complaints, I hope you see that I'm being fair to Infinite and Burial. I'm willing to give credit where credit is due. Unfortunately, that's just not very often. When there's something to compliment, I compliment. Where there are complaints to be made, I make them. Now moving on, calling what we see in Burial Gameplay is a very generous term. Yes, there is plenty of gunplay, but a solid quarter or maybe even third of both episodes is just straight up walking simulator, a term used by Charlatan Wonder that I think is fitting. For so much of the DLC's runtime, the player walks and walks and walks. Oh, maybe with the occasional break, to listen to the NPCs deliver a line or two. In this first person shooter, there's no actual shooting until about half an hour in, after getting sent to wannabe Persephone. It's nuts! Episode 2 has the same problem in the beginning, maybe to a lesser extent, but is just as bad if not worse by the end. The final half hour of the DLC consists of either more walking around, or you holding your controller as you watch cutscene after cutscene. May I remind you that you paid $30 for this entire DLC? If a solid quarter is just walking around, then you paid $7.50 just to walk and see cutscenes you can view on YouTube. Just throwing this out there, but the far superior Bioshock 2 DLC, Minerva's Den, is only $10 on Steam, so you can just buy that instead and spend the extra 20 bucks on an actually fun game like Skyrim. Although not as infuriating as spending an hour walking around are the loading times. I recorded it on PS3, so maybe a newer console or PC can run it better, but the loading times are abysmal. And no, not just the classic initial load screen when you start up a level. No, they are everywhere. You see, in the classic Bioshock games, once a level loaded, that was it. The entire area was functioning. 
You can roam around as free and wild as you wanted without needing to worry about loading or buffering. Burial at sea, however, each area you explore needs to be loaded in, so if you have to travel from one end of the level to the other, you will be slammed with multiple loads. The game tries to mask it behind the securest doors we find in Rapture, but spending 10 seconds just staring at a door turning isn't my idea of a good time. Even Infinite wasn't this bad. Well, that was a nice little divergence before cursing Ken Levine's name into the sky. Ah, I miss the good old days, when I had respect for Irrational. Good times. In episode 2, as I've said before, you switch from playing as Comstock to playing as an Elizabeth who has been stripped of all her power because I've decided Irrational Games just doesn't want us to have fun anymore. Because the all-powerful demigod Elizabeth is suddenly a worthless bum, the DLC goes from a typical FPS to a stealth game, and not an intense one like Amnesia or Arkham Asylum. Nah, it's just a really lame and tedious one. But the bland, bare-bones stealth mechanics aren't what I'm here to rant about. No, because in a stealth game, the player should be stealthy for a reason, like fear of getting shot or stabbed. Elizabeth, though, is still way more capable than the average splicer since the AI is so bad. Once the player picks up the Peeping Tom Plasmid, you get an edge by being able to know where all enemies are and the ability to turn invisible as long as you have Eve. So the tension is already broken, but to make matters worse, there's an upgrade for Peeping Tom in the Manta Ray Lounge. If the player picks it up, then the gameplay becomes totally and utterly broken. No joke, this isn't me exaggerating. The gameplay falls apart at the seams here. Elizabeth basically becomes an all-powerful killer again, but in what's supposed to be a stealth experience. The upgrade removes the Eve cost of turning invisible and x-raying while standing still. Before, you could abuse the plasmid only until you ran out of Eve, but after the upgrade, it's literally unlimited invisibility. Look at what I'm doing here. Elizabeth gets to straight up just run into a splicer, shoot it in the face, and then immediately turn invisible without anybody noticing. And even if another enemy sees it happen, the moment you turn invisible, they lose you and you're safe again. Okay, okay, but it gets even crazier. You can have an entire swarm of enemies around you and take turns killing them. Shoot one, turn invisible, shoot another one, turn invisible, shoot the next one, turn invisible. I've never played a stealth based game, let alone any triple A game with mechanics as broken as episode 2's. As you should remember, invisibility did make its way into the original two Bioshocks in the form of the natural camouflage tonic you got from researching Houdini splicers. With this tonic, you turn invisible after standing still for a few seconds, but there was a catch. The moment an enemy spotted you, it wouldn't work until every enemy alerted to your presence was either dead or lost you. And any movement or attack broke the invisibility until the coast was all clear again. So you couldn't abuse natural camouflage to go back into stealth mid-combat. But here, there's no penalty for being spotted. The enemies instantly stop firing and forget you were there even if they bump into you. Yes, Infinite's gameplay was bad and so fundamentally flawed, but at least it functioned. Hey guys, did you think this DLC was set in Rapture? Were you convinced that it was going to tie into the originals and show us some classic characters? Was there some incomplete Bioshock story that this was meant to wrap up? Well, boy were you wrong. A bad story is one thing, but Burial at Sea breaks and alters the canon at every chance it can get, almost as if it were some kind of game in the Irrational Writing Room. 
How much can we screw up from the originals? First to 100 wins. Alright guys, I'm going to list off all the retcons to Bioshock that I can find. I'm sure there are more, so please list them in the comments below if I miss anything. And I'll be repeating details I mentioned before. Here we go. Burial's Rapture takes on a 1950s style instead of the Great Depression Art Deco. Rapture was supposed to be isolated from the rest of the world. Any interaction with anyone else was severely frowned upon with penalty of death. So how was Su Chong able to collaborate with Fink while working for Ryan without him knowing and bagging him? Oh, and collaboration with Columbia in general. That was just stupid and took away from the brilliance of Rapture's scientific minds. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Customizable bathyspheres. Maybe not a bad idea in and of itself, but having the 50s and 60s car style with fins is ridiculous. Kinetoscopes in Rapture, a solid 60 years after they were relevant. The city is less brutal and more idealized. This DLC might as well be Ryan propaganda. The interiors of Rapture are now far more open and free instead of dark and claustrophobic. The removal of Persephone. Now political prisoners are left to rot in Fontaine's department store. No mention of Sinclair or Alexander at all despite them being integral to the protective program. A random secret entrance to Su Chong's clinic that we clearly don't see an opening for in the original. What happened to the spider splicers? Seriously, they were cool. Alpha series, although they should be present at this exact time, are mysteriously absent. Like most things Bioshock 2, Dr. Lamb just doesn't exist anymore. Little sisters in general, instead of being these vampire-like girls walking around and sucking blood, now they look more like Jimmy Neutron in serious need of an exorcism. Apparently that Asian girl Masha we heard a bit about from the first game was the first little sister to be bonded? Um, okay. Why not just name drop yet another D-list at best character? And wasn't she chilling with Rosie's and Neptune's bounty? Why do we see her bond with a bouncer? That thing? That, that is our Masha? But he was right. She was drawing blood out of a corpse by Fontaine Fisheries. Vents have a new design and have a gate that shuts over them, which would serve no practical purpose except for the exact reason Booker and Elizabeth use them. Big Daddies. Bouncers and Rosies exist before the Protective Program now, which, like everything else, is totally contrary to what we've learned before. It should be sisters first and then the Big Daddy. Instead of being drawn to their pheromones due to mental conditioning, the little sisters find the big daddy scary. Wait, so is this DLC trying to tell me that the pair bond isn't due to genetics or pheromones or science, but due to empathy? Friendship? I don't remember Alexander mentioning that. So did every big daddy have to be rescued by their sister to form a bond? How did Ryan Industries mass produce friendship? This is dumb. Booker fears harming Sally by heating up the vents, and Elizabeth feels bad for hurting Sally by doing so, but little sisters are supposed to be practically invincible since their massive amounts of atom instantly heals any damaged cells. Why the heck do bouncers shoot their drills like a harpoon? The moment you see it, it looks idiotic and awkward. Oh look, Burial at Sea retcons itself, the drill harpoon feature gets removed in later versions. I guess security bots and cameras just don't exist in this city anymore? Probably would have taken too much time to program their movement and physics just for the DLC. Turrets suddenly just have a lock on their back now and are far less useful as they adopt the security camera spotlight. There are infinite Comstocks and Elizabeths, infinite universes. How has Elizabeth managed to kill them all and finally die in the end? Infinite means infinite. Pneumotubes are now rails because...
We have to have skyhooks in Rapture. Why do we have skyhooks in Rapture? What the heck? Rapture citizens not splicing like crazy. No gatherers gardens. Plasmids are bought at gene banks instead of just stored there. Eve comes from salt containers now, not Eve hypos. Why does Cohen have an entire theater on High Street instead of sticking to Fort Frolic where he controls pretty much everything? I know Cohen shouting Fitzpatrick is supposed to be nostalgic, but what about his other disciples? What happened to them? If they betrayed him this early on, then wouldn't they be dead by the time Jack comes around? And when did he get involved in the child labor market? You would think that would have been mentioned. Frank Fontaine suddenly doesn't know Jack's trigger phrase despite specifically programming him and being with him since birth. Fontaine went from criminal mastermind to idiot who needs a random girl to save him. Why is Atlas planning in the department store instead of Apollo Square in the home for the poor? Fontaine dies and his business gets nationalized in September of 58, so Su Chong gets picked up by Ryan. Delta dies on New Year's of 58. Su Chong dies by the first bonded Big Daddy, which comes before Delta, so we know he's dead probably around October, November ish. So why is he alive until January of 59? Oh yeah, retcons. In Burial, we see the first Bond on January of 59, but that's weeks after Delta's death, who already had a Bond. A Bond so strong, in fact, that it started killing him. Drinkable plasmids? Like, what the heck? It's a cleaning up of what were supposed to be brutal and nasty sci-fi horror elements. And they're never mentioned in the previous games either. All the plasmids get their names changed to the Columbia Vigor names. Seriously irrational, how hard would it have been to switch some of the names back like Shock Jockey to Electro Bolt or Old Man Winter to Winter Blast? Ghosts are strangely absent. They were a helpful world building device in the original, but are missing here. Seeing ghosts was another bad side effect of splicing, as Recycled Atom carried some memories from its former hosts into its new one, so they should be in Burial. Actually, now that I think about it, they're absent from 2 also. Hmm. If Columbia was selling drinkable plasmids but calling them Vigors and still using Atom to make them, then how come nobody in Columbia suffers from Atom dependency? There aren't any splicers. Tonics get completely erased and are replaced by gears from Columbia, but hey, what else is new? Daisy Fitzroy gets turned from a political extremist to a brave martyr. Burial at Sea continues to retcon itself between episodes. In part 1, the hook can kill enemies in 2 or 3 hits, but by part 2, it does zero damage and only knocks them back. Also in episode 1, we see Sally yell for her big daddy, to which he responds by coming to her aid. So how come in episode 2, the bond hasn't been formed yet? How do you manage to retcon yourself? Did the writers run out of stuff to break from the originals, so they began breaking their own DLC? Look guys, I know Bioshock 2 had some alterations itself, adding a lot to the lore which in some ways helped, and sometimes it hurt. But Burial at Sea takes a sledgehammer to everyone and everything you ever loved. I'm sorry I doubted you 2K. Please take me back. Take me back. Bioshock has been my favorite game ever since I played it all those years ago. It was followed by an enjoyable sequel, a great DLC for that sequel, and yeah those. Guys, Bioshock didn't have a peaceful death or slowly fade into obscurity. No, Bioshock was murdered. Murdered by Ken Levine and his buddies at Irrational. Not only did Infinite and Burial's own stories suck, but the latter goes back and retroactively stabs one of the best games ever made. 
the iconic setting of Rapture is butchered. All the characters are made more incompetent to make room for Elizabeth and Columbia to play a key role. Whatever Irrational decided they don't like is wiped from the canon and any consistency is lost with dozens of retro continuity changes. The game beats you over the head with unrelenting references, but has zero respect for the nostalgia it's selling, using it to sell copies, but tossing the old away at any chance it gets. A series I once loved has been murdered, all thanks to Infinite and its terrible DLC. Guys, thank you for watching my videos. Even if they are 12 pages long like this, it's been a long journey from my 100 sub special as Tim Rex, the Infinite Rant, my eventually playthrough, the Bioshock retrospective, and now this. So, this is the end of my Burial at Sea and Infinite 2 part rant wombo combo. I really hope you enjoyed watching me blow smoke over this. Remember, if you enjoyed this video, to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media and Patreon. It means a lot to me. So, see you next time.